If you've been following our channel, you'd know that we've created detailed playlists on multiple topics relative to supervised learning, unsupervised learning, probabilities, data preparation, and all these videos have been curated in a specific sequence. Now, a common question that keeps coming all the time is that we want to have a better understanding of the basic libraries that are needed for data science. So keeping that in mind, for the absolute beginners, we are creating a playlist, which is called Dare to Learn Python. Now, this is not here to teach you Python programming. This is here primarily to focus on Python for data science. And in this sequence of videos, we are planning to add more videos so that we cover all the basic libraries. So in this video, we're going to talk about the library called NumPy, and this is part one of the tutorial. If you've ever followed a Python code, especially for data science, you would see in most of the codes, this is the first line, import NumPy as NP. NP is nothing but an alias given to the NumPy library, which is an efficient library available in Python for all sort of numerical computations, especially when dealing with multi-dimensional collections of numbers. So often a question comes that why are we using NumPy arrays when we already have lists? Well, it has more to do with the backend. So NumPy arrays are much more efficient when dealing with numbers. There's often an issue of compute that comes when you're dealing with a large collection of numbers and you have to work with appropriate data structures to be able to deal with it. So NumPy is specifically designed to deal with the numbers in a very efficient way compared to the lists. Another difference between lists and NumPy arrays is that lists could be heterogeneous, which means they can have a mix of elements. It doesn't matter that all the elements in the list have to be of the same nature. For example, some could be numbers, some could be strings. But in NumPy arrays, all the elements have to have one single data type, either all numbers, which is the most popular way to look at it, or all strings. You can't have a mix of it. Now let's just try to create a simple array. In fact, we can create an array using a list. So array is nothing but a basic building structure of NumPy, and we are creating an array, which is a simple collection of numbers passed through a list. So this square bracket one, two, three, four, five is a list, and we are passing it to the np.array method. This np is something that we can use here because that's how we alias NumPy. So let's run this and see what happens. So you get an output which says it's an array now. And if you want to check what is the data type of this array, of course you can see this clearly, but if you want to validate that, you will see that the data type is integer. Now let's try to create an array which is categorical in nature, though this is not very commonly used because most of the times we'd be creating arrays to do numerical manipulations. But let's say you want to create an array through strings. So we have different colors, et cetera, written here. And you don't have to write this import numpy as np every time. It's just that if you want to run a cell independently, you can do that. Otherwise, it's not needed. Once you've done it on top here, it's not needed to be called every time again and again. So you can consider this to be redundant here. Now we are creating an array using this list, which is a collection of all strings here and we are trying to print it. Let's see what's the outcome we get. So we get the outcome as we created it. Now there is some more outcome that we're getting, which is a part of the subsequent code. So in any library, there would always be a lot of inbuilt methods. And so is the case with NumPy. So this dot unique method, as you can guess, if you have duplicate entries in your list or the input, you can convert them to unique entries. In our case, the list to an array, and then we are passing that array to np.unique. It would simply show the output with the unique entries. Now we're going to use some other built-in functions. You may not realize what's the use of these built-in functions now, but these are very helpful in solving certain kind of programming problems. So just go through it and it's all very straightforward and simple. So if you want to create an array, which is just a collection of all zeros, and if we mention an input like this, which is a tuple-like input, three comma four, what does it mean? It means it's going to create a two-dimensional NumPy array with three rows and four columns. And all the elements in that array would be simply zeros because we're using np.zeros method. Let's just run this. So you see, we have three rows, one, two, three, and four columns, one, two, three, four. Similarly, you have np.1s. So let's say we create np.1s, an array of ones, and we are giving the shape as four comma four, which is four rows and four columns. So this will be a square array. That's how you get it. Likewise, if you work with matrices, you would know there is something called as an identity matrix, which is nothing but a square matrix where all the diagonal elements are ones and everything else off diagonal is basically zero. So let's create an identity matrix through this method called i, and we are giving only one dimension here that's five. 
because it's understood that an identity matrix is supposed to be a square matrix. So we don't have to necessarily write 5, 5. Let's just run it like this. And that's how it is. You can notice the diagonal elements are ones and everything else is zero. Now, how do we access elements in a NumPy array? That's something which is done through indexing and slicing. And that's what we're going to discuss next. So let's say we create a simple NumPy array, which is a one dimensional NumPy array of these five elements. We saw this earlier as well. And now let's say if you want to access the first element. So the important thing to remember here is that indexing in NumPy starts with zero. So this first element would be index zero. Then the second element would be index one, index two, index three, and index four. So if you have to access the first element of the array, which is this number one here, you'll have to write array square bracket zero. If you want to access the third element, you'll have to write zero, one, and two. So this is how you'll access the elements of the NumPy array. It works. Likewise, if you want to access multiple elements together, you can use something that's known as the slicing. And how it works is that we created the same array, and then we said we want to access the elements from the index one, starting index one, which will be the number two here, and the upper value here is exclusive. It's written here, this is exclusive. So it'll go from index one to index three, not to index four. So the first point, the starting point is inclusive. The second piece after the colon is exclusive. You go to the extent of last but one there. So what will happen is one, two, and three would be considered. Index one, index two, and index three. Element five here had index four, but this is not considered. Let's see what is the output. You see, you got two, three, and four. Why? Because index four is exclusive. This takes a little bit of time to digest it if you're new to this, but if you already are familiar with some other programming languages, most of the programming languages follow zero indexing. Let's say we created a bigger array and now we are also using something called as a step size. So it's an array, a one dimensional array with one, two, three, four, up to nine elements. And what we are selecting from this array is something that starts from index one, which means we start from the element two. We have not given the end point. If end point is not mentioned, it will go till the end of the array. And we've mentioned a step size of two. So step size means we'll take the first element from here, then we'll skip one step and go to this four, then it'll go to six, then it'll go to eight. Once again, you don't have another step to take, so you'll terminate this here. So what are we going to get as an output? Two, four, six, and eight. Let's run this. Two, four, six, and eight. Step size of two. If you don't mention the step size, let's say we remove this, it'll by default be considering the step size of one. So what will be the output in that case? You get everything till the last element. Why? Because now you can go up to nine. If it's not mentioned, it will be then considered. You can take the next step. But when we mention the step sizes two, notice that after eight, you did not have an element to take the second step. That's why it ended at eight itself. Can we do slicing with step? So here, if you notice, we've given the structure as no start index, no end index, and just the step size. What does it mean? You're going to consider it from the element zero, and you're going to go till the end of this. But how are we going to take the steps? Zero. The step size is not one, it's two. So zero, then two, then four, then six, then eight. And again, you don't have another step size of two after this. So you will end it down. So this will be starting with zero, ending with eight. Let's run this. See, zero, two, four, six, and eight. There's also an option of negative indexing, which essentially starts indexing from the end of the array. So if we have a one dimensional array like this, and if you write negative one, this would refer to the last element. Index zero refers to the first element. Index negative one refers to the last element. Similarly, this element will be accessed using negative two. Let's run this now. So negative one returns five. What would happen if we do it like this? So if we have an array, which is seven, four, five, six, ten, an unordered array, and if we have not mentioned the start index, end index, but we have mentioned negative two. What will be the output of this? Let's run this. You get 10, five, and seven. So step size is still two. The negative sign is just taking it to the end of the array. So 10, and then you come to five, and then you come to seven. That's how it works. Can we do integer array indexing? Can we write just the integers and not multiple integers, not just a colon like slicing? Can we get 
elements without an order as well. For example, here, if you see everywhere, we have taken elements in a certain order or a step size. But can we just take some elements randomly by just mentioning the index? We are trying that here. So this is an array and we mentioned that our indices of choice are index one and three. We're not specifying a general pattern or step size and we write one and three. Index one is this two, index three is this four, zero, one, two, three. Let's see if this works. How do we get this? So you have to pass this input, which itself is an array, as the indices to the original array to get the output. You get two and four, index one and index three. So we can also use Boolean array indexing, which is a very logical way to deal with a large data. You may not get to understand its importance right now because we are taking very simple examples. But if you're dealing with large data and you're trying to filter it based on some conditions, this could come very handy. So let's say we have one, two, three, four, five as our array, and we say that we want to filter all the elements greater than two, which means you should get three, four, and five. How do we do this? And we use that condition as an input to these square brackets, which will then filter the array as per the specific condition. Let's see. So you get the output as three, four, and five. This will come very handy in libraries like pandas, etc., where we are dealing with data sets and we have to apply multiple filters. So most of the examples we've seen so far are one-dimensional arrays. Let's move on to a multi-dimensional array. So if you see, this input is essentially a list of lists. Each element here, like one, two, three, in itself is a list. Four, five, six in itself is a list. Seven, eight, nine in itself is a list. And that's again being put under square brackets. So it's a list of lists kind of thing. And we are finally giving it as an input to a NumPy array. Now, if this is to be considered, this is called a matrix. It's a two-dimensional collection of numbers, which is known as a matrix. If you want to access a specific element of the matrix, you can mention the row index and column index. So when we say one and two, it means row at index one. So row indexing again will start from zero, zero, one. So we are talking about this row. And here we are saying we want to refer to the column index two. So columns are these, zero, one, and two. So if you see row is this and column index is two. So we are referring to the element which is six. Similarly, if you want to get a specific row, we can put it like this matrix and we want to get the row index zero and all the columns, which means you'll get one, two, three as the output. Likewise, if you want to get a column slice, we can mention all the rows. So when you put this colon alone, it means you're considering all the rows, but the column index one, which will be this specific column. Let's just run this. So here's the output you get. So element six, because it was the intersection of row index one and column index two. Then you get one, two, three, because you just gave input for the row index zero and all the columns. And then finally, two, five, eight, because we said we want to get all the rows belonging to column index one. If you want to check the dimensions of an array, you can do that using a very simple attribute called ndin. So let's just create some arrays. We're creating an array one, which is just one element. It's, it's just a number 42. Then we're creating a one dimensional array, one, two, three. And then we're creating another array, which is a two dimensional array, just like the matrix that we created some time back. And thereafter, we're creating another array, which is, if you see, a list of lists, again, put inside a list. So now this would be a three-dimensional array, popularly known as a tensor. Let's see how do we check what are the dimensions. It may be tricky to just count it, so you can use ndim to get this answer. When we run this, it says dimensions of this input, which is a one-dimensional array. You can see it's one, it's identified correctly. The second input, which was a matrix, it says it's a two-dimensional array, and this one is a three-dimensional array. When you start working with images, you'll have to understand how a basic image is constructed and that's where arrays come very handy. So you'll see more of it as you progress. So now there are a couple of interesting methods available within NumPy library, which come very handy for a lot of stuff. One of them is lint space or linear space. So how does it work? We can mention np.lint space 0, 1, 5. What does it mean? 0 is the starting point, 1 is the end point, and in case of lint space, for a change, both are included. So it includes 0, includes 1, and we are trying to create five samples. So what do you expect the output to be? A lot of times when this is asked, people will say the output will be 0, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 1. But that's not how the output is going to look like. Let's see what happens here. You're getting a slightly different output. Why? Because you asked it to give five numbers, including 0 and 1. 
So three numbers that can be there apart from zero and one, because you want a total of five, would be 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0.75. Now, if you've studied something called as an arithmetic progression, you would know there's a formula, which is last term is equal to first term plus number of elements minus one times the common difference. Now, if you see, in our case, we are going to consider the last term as one. The first term is zero. And if we write n minus one, n is five. So n minus one is going to be four multiplied by the difference, which is d. Now, if you solve this, you will get the value of d as one minus zero by four, which is one by four or 0.25. So this sequence will progress with an addition of d between every consecutive term. If the value of D is 0.25, what is my sequence going to be? Zero plus 0.25. This value plus another 0.25 will bring me here, plus another 0.25 will bring me here, and plus another 0.25 will bring me here. So that's how it works. Try to guess what will be the output of this. The first element or the starting point is 10. The stopping point is 20. And we are saying that the number of samples we want are 10. 10 and 20 if you want 10 samples, it's not going to be an obvious difference of 10, 11, 12, 13. It's again going to get calculated like this. So if I put it quickly, it will be something like 20 is the last term, 10 is the first term, plus how many elements do you want? 10 minus one, that will be nine times D. So the value of D that we compute upon solving this equation will be 1.11. That will be 10 by nine, that is 1.11. Now, if you see 10 plus 1.11 will give you 11.11. Then another 0.11 will give you 12.22, another plus 1.11 will give you 13.33, so on and so forth, till it reaches 20. That's how the computation works. There's a very important function that will be needing very commonly when running loops, that is called an A range function. Again, it has a start, stop, and step size. The important thing to keep in mind is, in lint space, start and stop both were inclusive. It starts from 10 and goes up to 20, and it does not really exclude the upper value, but in case of A range, the stop or the upper value is exclusive and it also takes a step size. So linear space function divides the data into values which fall on a line amongst these two values. But A range is essentially just going to generate the values as per the step size. So if we say np.a range 0 to 10 with a step size of 2, what do you expect as an output? 0 is inclusive, so 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. But the 10 as the upper value is not included. So when you get the output, you'll get it till eight only. Likewise, if I write five to zero and with a negative indexing. So it'll start from a five and it'll go towards zero. But this time zero would not be included. So it'll start from five and it'll go to four, three, two, one. And that's where it stops because zero is not inclusive. Let's just run this. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Now we can assess the array shape and we can also do reshaping on the array. So let's say this is a two-dimensional array. This is a list of lists. We have elements like four to five and seven, six, eight. This is an array. Now we have six elements and this is what? Two rows and three columns. Now, if we try to reshape this to three rows and two columns and try to look at the output, let's run this. And if I were to print, how do we know it has changed? Let's try to disable this and let's try to first just print the array. So. Let's just check this output right now. What does the array look like in itself? You see, this is two rows and three columns, right? Now, if we do a reshape on this, and you saw that output just some time back, if we check this a little better, reshaped array, and you can also check the output using the dot shape method. But let's say we reshape it and we try to print the reshaped array. This is three rows and two columns, as you can see. Now, what does the shape do? And what does the size do on an array? Let's understand this as well. So let's try to print arr.shape. What happens when we just do this much? This is a two dimensional array, which is two rows and three columns as we saw. And if we just check the shape, it says two rows and three columns, which is fair. Now let's understand what does the size do here? So I'll just comment out this piece and run just array.size. It says six. Dot size here is basically a product of rows and columns. Since we changed our, an array, which was 
two rows and three columns to an array which is three rows and two columns that was compatible. But what if we try to change it to something that's not compatible? For example, we have six elements here, two rows and three columns, but we are trying to change it to eight elements, which is two rows and four columns here. Will that work? No, it gives an error because this shape is incompatible. How can we put six elements at eight places? You have some elements list. So that's why it's giving an error. 